Because of the time I graduated from college, the second time, which was December, uh, not June, I had an unusually long internship. And so part of my internship was spent in Clovis, California. It was uh, an interesting time because shortly after arriving there, I uh, lost my uh, the girl I had been dating in college, and we weren't dating anymore, which was at the time, a painful experience. Uh, and then I was kind of in the no man's land there for a while, not at college where I could meet people and not sure where uh, my future was taking me. And I ended up about eight months into my time of internship being assigned to the Visalia Church. And last week, some of you met Ralph, who was my senior pastor there. Well, my first Sabbath there, I was sitting in Sabbath school, and who should walk through the door but my wife. And I looked at her and I said to myself, yes, that works. (laughs) Gentlemen, you may have other responses that you had when you saw your wives for the first time, but for me it was, yes, that works. She looked like someone who was, as the Bible would say, from among my people, so to speak. Well, she came in and she sat down right next to me and my college roommate who was seated beside me on the other side nudged me with his elbow and said, buddy, that's the move. (laughs) I didn't know that that would be the move, but we started visiting and she was very funny and very bright. And I liked her immediately. And so after church, we visited a bit. And then the following Friday, I was sitting in my office late one Friday afternoon. And in case you don't know this, in most churches, in most places, the church office is a tombstone on Friday afternoon. There is no life to be found at a church, an Adventist church, on a Friday afternoon. And so there I was in my office, and she had just decided to come by to see if the radio manager, we had a radio station connected to the Visalia Church, if the manager of the radio station might happen to be around because she had heard there was a young adult gathering that evening. Radio station manager wasn't around, but I was. (laughs) So we started visiting some more. And I invited her to the young adult gathering. As you can imagine, being a young intern, I was in charge of what? Youth and young adults, yes. Even I was a youth pastor once, even though I wasn't a youth once. That's kind of crazy, but true. (laughs) So in, uh, I I tell her about this event. I'm house-sitting for a couple in the church for the first couple of weeks. I'm there at uh, Visalia, and they had a lovely pool and and beautiful living room, and uh, we had all kinds of people invited, and we were going to spend the hours before Sabbath commenced or uh, began Uh, swimming and sharing some food, and then we were going to have a study after that time. So I invited Jill to come, and I thought to myself, okay, here's the deal. If she wears a one-piece, she's not interested. (laughs) If she wears a two-piece, she's interested. (laughs) Now, I don't know what your fleece would have looked like in that moment. That was my fleece. Okay. Is this too much information about your pastor? Okay. All right. Some people, it's like, oh, no, I did not want to know that about my pastor. No, 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 no. She wore a two piece. I said, she's interested. As it turns out, um, we had our gathering, and I don't know what happened. I don't know whether other people who had gathered sensed that. We needed to talk further or what, but all of a sudden, it was just the two of us. We talked and talked and talked. You know, it takes thousands of hours of conversation to really get to know somebody. Remind me to come back to that point when we, when we transition to our scriptural components. We talked and we talked and we talked. Invited her to lunch the next day, a couple weeks later. I mean, by a couple weeks later, we'd met each other's families. And she was headed off to anesthesia school at UCLA. And um, so I was in Visalia, and she was in UCLA, and on weekends she would drive up. This incredibly brilliant girl, there were only six people accepted into her class for this master's program through the School of Medicine at UCLA. Only six. She drove up to see me every weekend, because guess what? Pastors don't have weekends free. She drove up from UCLA every weekend to see me and still finished 
solidly in the middle of her class. Anyway, about 13 months in, we got married. That came about because, let's see, we started dating in August and about, what was it, March? I went down to see her at spring break and arranged uh, to propose. Now, back in that day, pastors didn't give their wives big diamonds and lots of jewels and that sort of stuff. It just wasn't done. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't have that kind of proposal in mind. So I had to make it special. And I had seen this show about Johnny and the Seven Cow Wife. How many of you saw that show, that movie? Oh, Richard, thank you. You are an Adventist among Adventists. What can I say? Uh, it was a, a, a movie that circulated some of the churches, and it was about an Islander man who uh, had, had known this girl in his childhood and wanted to marry her, and nobody in the village wanted to marry her because they all thought she was ugly. And the way things worked was dowries were paid by the number of cows. So a one-cow wife was a pretty ugly, undesirable wife, and nobody paid seven cows for a wife. Well, Johnny came back to the island. He wanted to marry her, and everybody was gossiping about what this would look like, and he came into the father-in-law with seven cows. And, of course, he gave his daughter's hand in marriage for seven cows. I mean, who wouldn't, right? <laughs> but she was a seven-cow wife and had the highest status in the, in the village. Well, I had seen that movie, and I thought... I want Jill to feel like a seven-cow wife. <laughs> I didn't have seven cows. I just wanted her to feel like one. So I arranged <laughs> this elaborate scheme um, whereby we flew up to the Bay Area, and uh, I had friends who met us and joined us for various meals, and Long story short, I put her in a small plane on an abandoned airfield in Santa Rosa, and at sunset we flew over the San Francisco Bay Area, and I proposed to her in the airplane. So uh, that took up all of my intern pay, and from there on I had to save. <laughs> from there on I had to save for the uh, the, the wedding and, and that sort of thing. I'll never forget though, as we as we shared breakfast. The look on her face after that engagement. I have a picture of her. I should probably make it into a poster. Holding a coffee cup, big, big smile on her face. So joyous and so beautiful and so happy. And I was so happy and honored because she was the one. I had found the one. This, this woman would be the partner of my life, would journey with me, would be the mother of our son, would uh, work beside me and I with her, and life would, life would happen, and we would engage it. And all the promise and all of the risk, all of the threat and all of the joy of that was ours as we journeyed. And many of you have stories that are uh, perhaps... Um, just as romantic or far more interesting in your own right. And I celebrate those with you today. I have the advantage of the microphone, so <laughs> mine gets heard today in a way yours might not. But I celebrate with all of you who have had that experience of meeting somebody and finding them to be the one and making that journey together in love. And that's an allegory, if you will, today for uh, the journey that we want to take with Christ. And I just want to um, take a moment now, and having shared that story, tell you a little bit about our texts for today. Our Song of Songs text, as Paul said, is probably a once-a-year phenomenon. In fact, Valentine's Day really doesn't happen on Sabbath very often, so I thought I would really have fun with this today. But in theory, we should feel free to read the Song of Songs publicly anytime. There are just portions of it that would make you blush. I remember as a little boy in church, somebody pointing out to me some of the racier passages in Song of Songs, and I think really one of the very first texts I ever memorized was in Song of Songs. <laughs> Thy two breasts are as the twin fawns of a gazelle feeding among the lilies. You chuckle, but it was spiritually formative, okay? Our Song of Songs is a Hebrew Kama Sutra, if you will, without pictures. 
It's a love poem, and it celebrates unabashedly romantic love. And my commentary on this is very straightforward and very simple. As Seventh-day Adventists, we celebrate a heritage that is more Jewish than Greek. I think that's really valuable. You see, in the Greek tradition, the immaterial was more important than the material. But in the Hebrew tradition, to be bodily ensconced, as it were, to be created in bodily form and to go through life with bodily existence was no shame. It was a good thing. Material creation was declared by the Creator to be good. Humankind was made male and female in the image of God, a complementary, a complementarity and declared good. Marriage was blessed and declared good, and love celebrated since the dawn of time. And so with that heritage, we find this, this book in the Bible, and we struggle. I know Christians through the ages have struggled with this, particularly if they've come from more of the Greek tradition. Why would this be in Scripture? Well, it must be allegory. It must only be about God's love for us. Well, it could be that. Origen certainly thought so, one of the earliest of biblical commentators. Jerome and Augustine certainly followed that. Many a Bible commentator has taken the approach that Song of Songs is really just allegorical for God's love and desire for us. But I think that if we're honest in terms of our appropriation of this text, and if we look more solidly at the Hebrew tradition, we'll discover that it really is a celebration of physical human, sexual, and romantic love. And that that indeed is not distinct and separate from who we were created to be and what God ordained us to do, do and to be and something that is deeply in its own right spiritual, connecting. You see, for this reason a man shall leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife. New homes formed, new attachments made, new alliances entered into, new covenants enacted, and this human race moves forward. It's celebrated in poetry, it's celebrated in art, it's celebrated in every way imaginable. And it's a delight to body, mind, and spirit. At least that's the intent. The intent is that, yes, while there may be allegory between the union of humans and the union of human and divine, that there's something deeply spiritual and deeply worthwhile and deeply sacred about the physical life we live and our union with one another. And the union between couples. And this is why God spends a lot of time talking about immorality and the way in which we deal with body and sexuality. Spends a lot of time talking about this because not only is Christ and the body the symbol of the church and marriage the allegory for that, but if we take an allegorical approach to Song of Songs, you have an intimacy described that mustn't be betrayed. And when we're immoral, we betray that intimacy. And that's what Scripture's really speaking to. The joy of intimacy is found in the context of faithfulness. You notice I didn't say the joy of sex. There are lots of people enjoying themselves in very promiscuous relationships. But that's not the joy of intimacy. That isn't the joy of connectivity. That isn't spiritually connecting. That's something else. That's a perversion, a deviation from what it is that God had intended and what it is that he wanted for humans in loving relations. We move to our next text. And our next text takes us to a slightly different direction, but I think you can still hear the author's emotion. You, the upright one, make the way of the righteous smooth. Isaiah 26, 7. Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your laws, now listen to this language. We wait for you. 
your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. How amazing is that? This idea that in Isaiah, the soul yearns in the night and the spirit longs in the morning. You ever loved somebody so much it hurt? Your heart is just so full of love for something or someone that you just can't contain it. That your desire is to spend as much time with that person or individual as possible. That you just can't get enough of time and space and connection with that person. That's what we're hearing in this passage. Listen again to the text, to the words. Sorry. There's waiting. There's desiring. There's yearning. There's longing. Sounds like love sickness to me. Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown, your reputation are the desires of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night, and in the morning my spirit longs for you. Talk about feeling alive. I remember the feelings that I had in the story that I just relayed of my romance with Jill. So alive we were. Such a sense of living and aliveness. I don't know how else to describe it. Everything awakened. And this writer of Isaiah is saying the same thing. As he thinks about God, as he meditates on God, as he considers God's reputation and God's law, as he considers all that God is, his soul feels that kind of awakeness, that aliveness, that sense of desire and connectivity, that longing for closeness. It's language that we're a little uncomfortable with, at least I don't really like connecting romantic and erotic language to the idea of my relationship with God. That's a little foreign to me. But it isn't foreign to Christian tradition. Mystics through the ages have had these types of allegories or used this type of language many, many times. It's because the language of ecstasy is the closest we can come to in describing both that sort of romantic feeling and also describing our experience of awe and wonder before God. It's an interesting thing to study. Our next text is a story in John. And it's a story you're terribly familiar with, and it's a story I've spoken to before. But before I get too far into it, I simply want to make sure that I give credit for the ideas, at least some of them will come to you this morning, to Kendra Holoviak Valentine, who teaches New Testament at La Sierra University and is an expert on the writings of John, particularly the Gospel of John and Revelation. She has a, a book that has been published fairly recently on the book of John and the seven miracle stories in John, particularly that it focuses on and the ways in which those might expand our understanding of who Jesus was and who the kingdom was. But she's very clever and very insightful and writes very well. And I would um, steer you to her if you get the chance to read one of Kendra's books or go to one of her lectures or uh, see her in some way. Please take advantage of the opportunity. She's a wonderful scholar and a wonderful person. Kendra points out as she uh, expounds on John 4, that when Jesus comes to the well at noon and he says 
these words to this woman in verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? It's not just a question of thirst. It's actually an act that would be understood to be pursuant to finding a wife. If we go to Genesis, and I invite you to turn to Genesis with me now, I'm going to read something in Genesis before we come back to our Gospel of John. I'm particularly reading from Genesis 24. This is the story of the romance of Isaac and Rebekah. Romance looked pretty different back in this age, but nevertheless, here's the story. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I'm now living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. There's that phrase in the King James, from among my people. Turns out Jill was very close to my people, but that's another story for another day. I was born in Tacoma Park. Her dad was born in Tacoma Park. The servant said to him, What if the woman is willing, unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? And Abraham says, Make sure that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household in my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, Take your offspring, I will give this, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife from my son there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine, only don't take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Naharim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was towards evening, the time when the women go to draw water. Now Josephus tells us that women drew water typically in evening, but it wasn't uncommon in some areas for them to draw water midday as well. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her, to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels, too, until they've had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well, and drew more water, and drew enough for all of his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. Then he said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, bore to Nahor. And she, she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder, as well as room for you to spend the night. The man bowed and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has med me, led me on the journey to the house of of my master's relatives. The girl ran and told her mother about mother's household about these things. Now Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, he had heard Rebecca telling them, them excuse me, and had heard Rebecca 
tell what the man had said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, he said, you who are blessed by the Lord, why are you standing out here? I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house, and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels, and water for him and his men to wash their feet. Then food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you what I have to say. And the story goes on to say a repeat of this, a recounting of events in which the young woman's hand is asked for in marriage. It says in verse 59, So they sent Rebekah on her way along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said to her, O sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. And with that blessing, Rebekah and her attendants got ready and mounted their camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac had come from Bir Lahai Roy, where he was living in the Negev. He went out into the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all that he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You know that story? When John is writing his gospel and the story of Jesus is told, this is the story that's evoked. A story of a woman at a well. A woman who, because of her kindness and generosity, became the mother of nations, Abraham's son's wife, Isaac's wife, Rebecca. She is richly endowed for her efforts, but she is willing in her heart to do as God has led and to become Isaac's wife. She was probably quite young. Leaving her kinsmen would not have been an easy thing for them, and people didn't have airplanes, trains, and cars to get them anywhere quick. Ten camels and a long journey would have been the road back home. But she doesn't choose that. And the romance between these two, Isaac and Rebekah, lives on in biblical story. You see... Abraham's servant was looking for the one, for his master's son. Jesus says these words, and this story is evoked, and the Samaritan woman says to him in shocked disbelief, for she knows this story too. Her scriptures contain these words as well. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? We're tempted to read this in terms of clean and unclean, the Jew-Gentile division. There may have been a small element of that. But a response came more from, from more than disassociation. It came from the underlying meaning of the words. But Jesus turns it around. This isn't about him seeking a wife. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now her attention is piqued. And skepticism comes alive. Oh, yes, she's not a young virgin. She's a woman of the world, and she's not about to be pulled into something she can't manage. So her response is rather quick. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? We get to a reverse pedigree here, don't we? Who are you? This was the question that Eliezer, Abraham's servant, was asking of the girl who came out and gave them water. Who is your family? and Where do you come from? Are you greater than Jacob? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. 
But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The physical has just gone into the metaphysical, the spiritual. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. A practical woman. Isn't that how we sometimes approach our relationship with Jesus? It's a matter of practice. You know, if you'll do this for me, that would be great because then I don't have to bother with this. She still didn't get it. Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, you're right when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you've had five and the man you are now with is not your husband. So what you've said is quite true. At this point, she has to catch her breath just a little bit. The game has taken a decidedly unfavorable turn. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. And then she takes the conversation into theological waters. Some of our forefathers say that we must worship in Jerusalem, but our forefathers say we should worship on this mountain. What say you? And Jesus says, I want all people to worship in spirit and truth. There's something really powerful about finding the one on human terms. But there's something even more powerful about finding the one in spiritual terms. And while Eliezer found the one for Isaac, and theirs is a romance for history, the woman at the well did not find a romantic partner, and Jesus didn't find in her a wife, but she found the one the desire of Israel, the one of whom Isaiah spoke, my heart yearns for you in the night, my spirit longs for you in the morning. When we've found the one, it changes the journey. When we think about dating and romance and love, didn't feel like that much effort, did it? Oh, sure, we went to extra lengths to show our interest, to show our appreciation, to show our intent, to show our love. Hopefully we still do some of those things sometimes. But with all of that energy and all of that goodness, all of that positivity and all that feeling, it didn't feel like work. It was something we wanted. It was something we were willing to pursue. It was something we were willing to give ourselves to. It was something we were willing to do, and it was someone we were willing to commit to. That's how we view it. That's our human reality. And if we take all of those things and apply it to our relationship with our God, does that shape in any way what it means to be with him in the next year and through the rest of our lives? Is it a burden? Is love a burden? Is it a liability? Are we really that jaded? Would we say that spending that time wasn't worth it? Investing that energy didn't yield a reward? I'm not asking you to love Jesus in some weird kind of romantic way. I'm asking you to think about what that kind of consuming relationship looked like in human terms and say, what might it look like in human divine terms? What sort of energies might we be willing to commit to a relationship with God if we saw him as the lover of our souls, as the one who gave all for us, as the bridegroom to the bride who spared nothing, including his own life, 
who's made every provision for our happiness, our salvation, our eternal security, our grace. What would that look like?